Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. Also, The Criminal Mastermind of Baker Street by Rob Nunn, now available from MX Publishing. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, Episode 139, The Strand Magazine. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, A podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. (laughs) The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well... Hello, once again, and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Wolder. And can you believe it? We've made it through the first two months of the year. What's next? Ah, St. Patrick's Day is next, and then the 4th of July, and pretty soon Labor Day, and now I've got to get out my Halloween decorations. Hey, who's coming over for Thanksgiving? God, I haven't even done my Christmas shopping yet. (laughs) Oh, no. You're in big trouble. (laughs) You are in big trouble. I'm not going to, I'm going to tell them at the Hallmark store that you're not with the plan. Wow. (laughs) Wow. Well, hey, hunker down, folks. March is upon us, and uh, what's, what's the saying? In like a lion, out like a lamb. Smack your head like a fistful of spam. Oh wait, that's that's not. That's what my grandpappy used to say. No, I thought it was smack your head like Charles Lamb. No. <laughs> well, he was a bruiser. I guess so. Well, his sister just beat him up a lot. I think that's what happened. Crazy. Mm. Crazy. Well, we have another fine show for you today. We are going to be interviewing Andrew Gooley from The Strand Magazine to talk about the uh, current iteration of that venerable publication, that publication that first brought Sherlock Holmes to the public's attention. Before we get to that, we do want to remind you at the end of the show, please stay tuned all the way through. We have our biweekly quiz contest, the canonical couplet. We will announce our previous winner, and we will kick off the latest edition. So if you would like to play along, listen all the way through. Be one of the first to uh, respond. You actually have to be the first to respond with a correct answer. And we will reward you with some tchotchke publication, something from the IHO's archives here in Michigan. And we will delve into the vault and pick out some of the most valuable stuff, and we'll try to match it to your uh, your likes and interests. So stay tuned for that later in the show. And of course, we still welcome ratings, reviews, donations, however you'd like to show your support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. We have the options. It's available on the website, IHearOfSherlock.com. And the show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash ihose139, all lowercase, ihose.co slash ihose139. You can find links to things that we mention in the show here, as well as the ability to donate, uh, links to pretty much every audio option that you can imagine, and, of course, ways to get in touch with us, which include email, If you can hit us up at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with an email, you can comment right on the show notes. You can visit us at our Facebook page, on Twitter, on Instagram. We are IHearOfSherlock in all of those social spaces. 
Yes, and we should also point out that the last two contest winners that we had, which if memory serves, were Sandy Cozen and Michael Bush, Mm -hmm. were enthusiastic about the prizes that they won. And it must be a great relief to you to be able to look around your office and not see that awful sousaphone anymore. (laughs) I do what I can, but... You know, I'm really looking forward to getting rid of the Hound of the Baskervilles droppings. It's uh, just been taking up too much space of late. So, uh, what can I tell you? But yes, uh, that is part of the benefit of being a regular supporter of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. If you support us via PayPal or Patreon, that makes you eligible to, uh, to win a prize. Uh, you can certainly participate in the quiz if you like, uh, but you will not be getting a prize unless you are part of our regular donors. So choose wisely. Yes, and I think that future prizes, although we don't like to predict this to take away the the excitement of wondering what you're going to get, might include an all-expense-paid trip to the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex. <laughs> The ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex has begun restoring the Dorset Cursus, our Neolithic monument spanning 10 kilometers of the chalk downland of Cranbourne Chase. But we'll take a break from all that digging by reading another chapter of House of the Doomed, Dan Andriaco's Adventure of Sherlock Holmes, published by our Wessex Press. In Surrey, Holmes and Watson encounter the writer Arthur Conan Doyle. Rumors of ghosts and occult rituals add to the mystery and suspense. And they meet an old friend, the one police detective on the same level as Holmes himself. March is the month of expectation, the things we do not know, the persons of prognostication, the Phoebe and the Crow. As the days lengthen, reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wes Express can provide. Choose yours today. You know, so here's here's the question: uh, If we do provide a trip to the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex, do we provide a TARDIS as well? <laughs> well, we could do. The issue there is you're on your own when it comes to your shots. <laughs> <laughs> well, do do they still offer inoculation against the bubonic plague? I I don't know. I don't know. I think it's I think it's more charms and rituals. I don't know that we actually get down to the inoculation stage. Oh, that would that Although although I'll tell you there is some moldy bread there, so maybe that's the next thing. <laughs> well, charms and rituals are probably the best way to get around uh or, or get away from things there. So, well done. Well, we are honored to welcome Andrew Gooley to the program. Andrew is the managing editor for The Strand Magazine. And I don't know how many of you are aware that The Strand Magazine is still in circulation. Uh, since 1998, Andrew has been overseeing this venerable title uh, and has basically jam-packed every quarterly issue with some wonderful contents to hear about exactly what those contents are and how Andrew came to this enviable position. We spoke to him. Andrew, welcome to the show. Great to be here with you guys. Excellent. Well, as we start off our interview, as we do with everyone, let's find out when exactly it is that you first met Sherlock Holmes. Oh, that's a complicated story. That's very layered. I I met Sherlock Holmes, I would say, about 1982. Uh, We were living in Athens, Greece, and we had a black and white television. Uh, And it was a Sherlock. It was a British Sherlock Holmes. And I don't. I don't. I can't even find many references. So maybe you guys will know better than I will. But. Anyway, one of the first stories that I saw was the, uh, the, the, the the vampire story. And I have to say I was following my mom all around the house because I was so afraid to go to bed. 
But I just loved how Sherlock Holmes, this, this incredible guy who managed to save the day. Uh, and for about, I think, about a couple of months, for every week, there would be an episode, a half-hour episode of that Sherlock Holmes uh, series out of England. And after that, I was like, oh, my God, he's the greatest. Uh, and then a few years later, when I turned, uh, I, was at, I was about seven at that point. And then when I turned nine, my brother, who was in the States, called me up and he was saying, I'm buying you a bunch of books because the books in Athens were, English books were not as easily accessible and they're quite pricey as books were from America. So my brother says, I'm buying you the complete Sherlock Holmes stories and they all have illustrations from the Strand magazine. And guys, over the years, you know, via long distance, when I heard him tell me that, those words always ring ring through my mind. <laughs> so had you, were you aware of the Strand magazine before that, or was that your first exposure to the Strand? That was my first. I didn't even know what he meant by that. They have all these illustrations from the Strand. I was like, I was nine. I was like, what's the Strand? <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, and then when he brought, a, he brought the uh, the book over, I was like, I'm amazed by the illustrations by Sidney Padlet. Uh, and then I became a real Sherlock, you know, where I would even read some of the stories to my mom and she'd give me some, you know, my mom was like a critic. She'd be saying, mm, this story, I think Doyle's sounding like an elderly gentleman across a fireplace. It's just like he's just telling it to us. And like, mom, you're a good editor. <laughs> <laughs> How how long did you live in Athens? We were there for ten years, and it was a it was a dream for a kid because you had three hundred days a year where you had sunshine, and we'd be swimming from April till late October. So it was a it was a wonderful life. And what brought you there? Well, my dad was. Uh, my dad was an engineer, and he was working throughout Europe and parts of the Middle East. And uh, they asked his, the company he worked for asked him which European capital he'd like to uh, like for us to settle down in. And we went. He went to Paris, he went to London, and he just looked. And he's like, I love Athens. I love the weather there. I just love that. He liked that, you know, that feeling where there it was a gateway to the west and a gateway to the east. So. Mm-hmm. And he made the right decision because it was just a wonderful country and lots of opportunities to read and not watch TV because TV was, the, you know, end at midnight on most days except for weekends. And what they did have on TV at times were these wonderful British TV shows. Yeah. So I remember watching Jeremy Pratt and the Sherlock Holmes stories when I was, uh, I think it was about 10, I was 10, or, 10 or 11 then. And that rekindled my my uh, my fascination with Sherlock Holmes at that point. Uh, so they had a lot of uh, a lot of those wonderful British imports, which till today I will never forget. Yeah. Oh, the the adventure of the Greek engineer. <laughs> How do you like that? Um, oh, I love that. I love I love the the Greek interpreter. I'll never forget. Then they tell the, the one of the characters a line like. If you don't do this, you'll wish that you were never born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's they, they did a really good job with that one. Um, they did. They did a lot of the early ones were fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, so when did you uh, repatriate to America? 1988, we came back. My dad, unfortunately, uh, was diagnosed with lung cancer. Wow. So, yeah, we came back home, and sadly, he... Uh, he passed away after a couple of years. And and did you continue your uh, your interest in Sherlock Holmes once you returned, or did it take like Sherlock Holmes? Did it take a hiatus? I continued, and I was I was a rather dorky teenager and child. You know, I mean, you know, I was this type of guy who would have a when I was even twelve. I had I'd be carrying books that weighed more than I did. <laughs> There are some photographs of me where I was, uh, I'd be sitting by a swimming pool in you know, a hotel where we'd swim every, every few days, and I would, I'd have a book that was like weighed 
30 pounds, all about the history of the world. So uh, I carried my, my love of Sherlock Holmes when I was a teenager where I would read, reread all the stories and reread Otto Penzler's great library of books based on Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and then I watched a lot of the films like The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Some I liked, some I didn't like. Uh, tried to get into a lot of the pastiches and and normally when you're a purist, you start thinking, ah, I don't like anybody who's making his, his making a living or getting some money off of a great character's books. But when it, the more I read some of these authors, that completely changed my attitude because I realized that these writers had a great story to tell. Uh, and they were keeping Sherlock Holmes alive, and that's the most important thing, whereby this character is not something that's just a character that's etched in stone and that will grow dusty with the, with the years, but somebody that will just, where you can always find new stories to tell. And I'll, I'll, I'll add a caveat that new good stories, not every Sherlock Holmes prestige is something that I'm going to be happy about. And was that the path that got you into publishing, into magazine publishing? And how did you come to restart the Strand? It was. I mean, if you, uh, I, I used to collect the old Strand magazines, and when the time started, uh, you know, I spoke to a few people who were uh, interested in starting a magazine, and they heard of me, they heard that I collected these magazines, and and the magazine just took on a life of its own. It was 19... 19- 98 when we had started and my mom had passed away a year before so the type of feeling where you know, when when you when you're when you're you know not quite happy with things you're ready to take on a challenge that you are certain may not work out but you're just like eh, what the heck let me try this and sure enough the magazine ended up taking on a life of its own uh, I'll never forget. Have you heard of the Murder One bookstore in London? Oh, sure. Yeah, with Maxim Dekabowski. Great guy. Great Sherlockian as well. So I remember when I, when, when I was first working as editor of the magazine, I said to myself, you know, this is going to be a magazine that's going to stand on its own. So we're going to just, you know... You know, we're not going to have a pastiche unless it's a great pastiche, and we're not going to have anything to do with Sherlock Holmes. This is going to be a strand magazine, which will just, you know, we're not going to try to try to cash in on the whole Sherlock Holmes thing. Uh, so I remember we contacted them about carrying the magazine, and they said, well, we'll order about five copies of the magazine. Uh, but if you're going to have Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes pastiches, We'll order about 30 copies of the magazine. Ah. So very quickly, our priorities change. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's that's not too dissimilar from the original Strand magazine. They, they found that their subscriptions just went through the roof when uh, a Sherlock Holmes story was involved. And it, it kept them going back to Conan Doyle and uh, being willing to pay him more money simply to add – uh, those great stories to the um, uh, to to the publication. Exactly. I mean, people always, you know, he is a draw. And, and the wonderful thing about Sherlock Holmes is, I remember years ago I would go to a Sherlock Holmes uh, society meeting, and I was like generations younger, I felt, than everybody over there. Uh, and you know, in my mind, I was asking myself, you know, a lot of our readers are interested in Sherlock Holmes, and is this a demographic that will ever replenish itself? Uh, and you're now seeing the Robert Downey, Jr., the Robert Downey film, the Dude Law, and you're seeing the Benedict Cumberbatch uh, series. And, you know, that is telling us that Sherlock Holmes is getting a whole new generation of fans. And to me, that is just a wonderful, wonderful thing to hear, not from a business standpoint, but as much as something whereby this is a character that is really standing the test of time. That's, I think that's absolutely right. You know, keeps, keeps being reinvented. So, so has the strand, the new strand been with us now for 20 years? 
I can't believe it. You're making me feel old. But fortunately, I was very young when I started out. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be the uh, uh, it'll be the twentieth year, uh, December December twenty three of this year. Okay. So I don't know what I'm going to have to do for that. Probably <laughs> leave town. <laughs> uh, so um, was was when you when you resurrected the. Uh, the title of Strand Magazine, since it hadn't been used since, what, the, the late 1940s, was there anything with regard to copyright or uh, trademark that you had to be uh, aware of or work around? Yeah, this is one of the things where uh, where you, you come up with an idea and you want to do something and then you just realize that there's all sorts of uh, legal maneuvers and, you know, Paperwork that you need to go, get, you need to, you know, sign and file before you can do anything. So, I remember speaking to my copyright lawyer, and he said, "Well, you know, first thing you need to do is you need to go to a website called Thompson and Thompson and pay about two hundred dollars for a trademark fee. If uh, I think it was Article Sixteen, if Article Sixteen has Strand Magazine, then." You can't do it. You'll have to find uh, have to find the trademark holders and negotiate with them. And I really can't help you. So I'll never forget exactly where I was sitting in my office. But I put in Strand Magazine, and I had one of those old computers that are were very modern then. But you know, today they'll look like bell bottoms <laughs> or the equivalent <laughs> of a bell bottom. Uh, and when I clicked on search that capsule just was took an eternity and I'm just waiting and waiting. And then finally zero results. And I was like, yeah, that's mm. great. So, uh, and then after that, we of course had to file the papers for the strand magazine and uh, deal with the, uh, the U S patents and, uh, trademark office. And we, uh, we ended up getting the trademarks of the strand. Uh, on an interesting side note, the British crime writer John Creasy tried bringing the magazine back in the uh, in the 1960s, uh, and the magazine ended up uh, the magazine ended up failing after uh, after 13 issues. Hmm. Uh, and he was an incredible publicity hound. I mean, he he had it. He he tried garnering publicity for the new strand by staying in this uh, shopping uh, department store window where he was working on a book for 24 hours and having people photograph him and just doing all sorts of things to promote the magazine. And that, that was the, uh, that was the type of guy who John Creasy was. <laughs> so as you, as you put together each issue, uh, I, I would imagine you, you have a, you know, kind of a, a signature article or, or kind of a, a featured item. Um, but how do you how do you go about building uh, each issue of the magazine? And, th- and this is, is, is it a monthly magazine or quarterly? It's a quarterly. Quarterly, okay. So how do you go about building each issue? Well, you, the same with magazines and, you know, you don't want to know how magazines put together the same way you don't want to know how governments work or sausages are made. <laughs> There's very little glamour. Uh, I mean, each magazine has its own set of, set of challenges because you can get one magazine where everybody who's submitted to you is submitting something funny. You can get a magazine where everybody who's submitted a story to you has something that's very morbid. And then you'll find you get the theme whereby, you know, three famous writers send you something. They want this a short story and they want their story in this, let's say, a holiday view. And everything has something to do with stolen jewelry. <laughs> so you end up you end up getting these like things which will just like have you say like or, like why are the stars aligned in such a weird way? Uh, but at the end of the day, you need to just try to have a balance. You need to try to strike the balance between you know, having something that's a little cozy, something that's noir, something that's a Sherlock Holmes story. You know, you need to make everybody happy and not be too predictable because mm-hmm. whenever we, you know, whenever the pendulum is swings very, very far, far aside from what our main core audience is, we find that our, our readers are not as happy. Our readers like to be, they like to have 
a varied mix of articles, short stories, uh, interviews in the magazine. So, you know, we'll always have, let's say, for a lock home story, a short story with a twist, uh, something noir, something set in England, uh, and then we'll have an interview with a famous author or an actor, uh, and then we have about 15 book reviews. That's interesting. Well, you know, you have uh, very much a clear, a clear direction, a clear path, a clear definition of what your reader's interests are. But I get the idea that your interests are much wider and broader. Because over the years, haven't you been involved in finding a lot of uh, lost or never published stories from people like Faulkner and Tennessee Williams and Steinbeck and so on? Yeah, that, to me, that's one of my passions. And I, a lot of readers are now coming to expect that, oh, in every issue of the magazine, we'd like something that's never been published before. Uh, and I am slowing it down because I am finding that you know, these it's like a precious commodity where, you know, it's, it's finite. It's not every day that you're going to get something by Tennessee Williams or something by uh, you know, William Faulkner, Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, but anyway, uh, over the, I'm, this whole thing started in 2009. I had heard that there was going to be a collection of stories by Mark Twain that were never published before. So I said to myself, Andrew, you need to get your hands on one of these. Uh, so I met with the publisher and I negotiated to have, uh, you know, do a little write up in the magazine knowledge that this book would be coming out if they would give me one of the unpublished stories by Mark Twain in advance of publication. So, you know, we worked on that, and then I read about a Graham Greene novella, so I contacted the Graham Greene estate. Uh, but interestingly, a lot of times people say, oh, he's found this, and they'll clump a lot of the things that I've found that were not published before with things that, you know, people have known about. But one of the biggest thrills was after we completed the uh, the Graham Greene work, I had found a story by James M. Cain, of, you know, the author of Mildred Pierce and the Postman Always Drinks Twice. Uh, and I'd found that at the Library of Congress, and I published that story. Uh, and then after that, I found uh, a short story by Joseph Heller called Almost Like Christmas, uh, which was never published uh, and then recently we uh, released an unpublished story by Raymond Chandler called It's All Right, He Only Died, which is a, a real indictment of the health care system. And he'd written that 60 years ago. So, uh, so this has become a real, real, real passion of mine. But I am realistic and I am realistic. I do know that we can't keep this going forever. <laughs> Well, how do you? So, how does one become? What's how does what's the path from um, discovering Sherlock Holmes when you're ten years old in Athens to to becoming a sort of the Indiana Jones of uncovering lost literary treasures by such a variety of people: Steinbeck, Tennessee Williams, Raymond Chandler. And and how, what's your day like? I mean, do you sort of sit down with the calendar and say, you know, next Wednesday? Yeah, Library of Congress, that's where I'm going. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wish it was so, so, so glamorous. I remember I, I, last uh, last year, at book, a couple of years ago at Book Expo, Michael Pete Sami, and he says, Andrew, you're not looking too dusty. Uh, he's the uh, CEO of Hesset Publishing. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, well, aren't you always in these libraries discovering these famous works? Uh, and I said, no, not really. A lot of it is done through uh, through researchers and through looking through finding aids. I mean, we live in a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time today where I can do a lot of my work remotely. I'll give you an example about the Raymond Chandler story. There are two parts of his, uh, his work. One part is at the uh, University of California, and... The other, uh, the other part of his work that I at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. So I remember I contacted the head librarian. I said, "Look, I need you to, uh, I need you to give me a list of all his finding aids, all the work that the titles that you have." So this poor guy who was working with uh, with me, who I'm, and I'm very, I'm relentless when I want something. 
<laughs> I said, you know, I'd like such and such title. So this guy would send me copies of this work, uh, of a lot of the titles, and I would reference and cross-reference and do all this research. And I was just so frustrated because every time I'd think that I'd I thought that I'd discovered something by Chandler that was not published. I'd find another source and be like, oh my God, this is turning into a very a nightmare and a very expensive nightmare so, <laughs> because I was paying for all this research. So finally, there was a, in, in like scribbled in one of the finding aids that he sent me, something that says, two box uh, containing it's all right. I called him up and I said, hey, I, wanna, I want the contents of that two box. I said, because there's something that says it's all right. He's like, it's all right. It's done. There's nothing. I said, no, 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 no. We've gone this far. So he copied the contents, sent it to me, and I'll never forget when I was opening it up, opening the uh, envelope up, I did my rendition of Sydney Green Street in the Maltese Falcon thing. Fifteen years I've waited for this. So I opened it up and I said, no, this has not been published before. So, uh, so that's, that's how a lot of, a lot of my work has been done. But a lot of times you'll hear that I've discovered a, you know, let's say a work by H.G. Wells or I, uh, we've discovered a a ghost story by Wells that was never published before. But for every time I've found something, I can tell you, you can get into a position where you find something that's just not good enough to be published. And, you know, to me, I, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's helpful to an author's legacy. If you're publishing something that's just something they would not be proud of. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dorky enough to say to myself, I would love to sit and have tea with Robert Louis Stevenson or you know, or lunch with H.G. Wells, and I would not want them to, like, throw orange juice in my face, or Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and now we pause for a brief word from our sponsor. The Criminal Mastermind of Baker Street. It's a new book that's out from MX Publishing, and it's by none other than Rob Nunn. Rob, of course, uh, occasionally contributes to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere uh, on our website, and he has his own uh, his own blog called uh, Interesting Though Elementary. And uh, he, of course, has uh, taken great and keen interest in the world of Sherlock Holmes, having been a Beacon Award winner in the past few years. And this is his first approach to, I guess we could call it a pastiche. Um, it's, it, it's not quite what you would consider a pastiche uh, when, when you think about them. Because what Rob has done is he's taken every single story in the canon and looked at it from the point of view of Sherlock Holmes being a criminal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, li- I like that approach. I mean, the um, it's such a wonderful thing to take a look at a character that's particularly well devi- defined, and then say to yourself, you know, what does the negative look like? What does the what does turning it all on on its head look like? What would the mirror image, you know, if if things had gone differently, look like? Because that's a great way to get more insight into a lot of the dynamics you take for granted. Well, that's right, and and there was um, some point in the canon, I believe, where uh, either Holmes said or or one of the police inspectors said, "We're fortunate that you haven't turned your your brain to crime." Uh, and uh, yes. you know, he, he could be a formidable criminal if he, yes. if he did put his mind to it. Well, I remember that interchange. Holmes then replied, "Yes, you're absolutely right, and here's your watch back." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, some criminal mastermind. Yeah. Uh, well, um, you know, this is just a, a fascinating and different way to uh, to look at uh, the, the relationship between Holmes and Watson and their lives. Um, you know, from from the very beginning when they met in that laboratory at St. Bart's, all the way through the final adventure that they have together in 1914 in his last bow, uh, but. When Holmes sees his his work go unrewarded so many times, and particularly early on, 
that's when he decides to turn his brain to crime. And, you know, along the way, you get to see how Scotland Yard and, uh, and Mycroft and Moriarty and the rest of uh, Victorian London deal with a criminal mastermind like Sherlock Holmes, who, like Moriarty, I guess, sits in the center of the web. Hmm. So I guess the, the real question I'm, I'm dying to see is if uh, Moriarty and Watson moved in together. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be fun. Huh. Yeah. Yes, well, that's what we need. We need a, you know, a gentle and thoughtful and troubled public-spirited mathematics professor, fresh from writing his important treatise on the dynamics of an asteroid, turning his attention to solving uh, these criminal permutations in society. That's exactly what we need. There you go. There you go. Well, if this sounds even remotely interesting to you, uh, you can find it available directly from the publisher at SherlockHolmesBooks.com. And, of course, it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Strand Magazine, uh, their shop has a copy of it as well. Uh, soft cover, ebook, and audiobook versions. So pick your poison. <clears throat> and now, back to our regularly scheduled content. How, you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, and briefly, you referred to some Sherlockian societies. Over the years, have, are, are you engaged or connected to any Sherlockian groups, local Sherlockian groups, or? Do you have? Do you, are you part I of that used, community? I used to uh, go to the amateur mendicant society, and they're a wonderful, wonderful group of people. But I've not been in a in a while. I need to. Uh, I have plans on my agenda this year, attending one of the meetings and seeing some of my friends. I mean, I've heard that one of my friends from the olden days had passed away. So I'm saying to myself, time to reconnect with a lot of very wonderful people because. Uh, the Sri community is a kind group of people. I'll never forget that uh, we're working with a with a company that sells Sri Lankan souvenirs, and you know they were saying, you know, the, how how wonderful all the customers were, and how kind they were, and friendly. Uh, and uh, I told them some experiences that we had just with general people who buy general books, and they said, "Oh, God, we're so happy in our niche because." People are just there's such an understanding, such a kind, such a welcoming group. And over the years, it's been something which has really, really, really resonated with me. Because, you know, it's, and in general, people who love mysteries. I mean, you go to a convention of mystery fans, and you're seeing, one of, you're seeing some of the biggest names in publishing. And a lot of them will not hesitate to sit and have a cup of coffee with an aspiring writer and give them advice and say, hey, you know, if you want, I can even, I can even refer you over to my agent. Uh, and, you know, that stands in contrast to some of the other conventions or especially I've heard about some science fiction conventions where, you know, the atmosphere is not as collegial as, as that of mystery fans and Sherlock Holmes fans. How does one go about getting a story published in the Strand Magazine? Uh, is is it a matter of, uh, you know, just sending in a submission, or or do you uh, kind of uh, hand pick people and and make requests of them to to write for you? I would say about eighty percent of the time we'll hand pick people, and then twenty percent of the time if people contact us, send us a query, come up with something that an interesting idea, then we'll take a look at it, and then we'll, you know, we'll try to publish it. I mean, just in the last, uh, in the last issue of the magazine, it was this one, with the, with the, where the Raymond Chandler story appeared, we had two authors make submissions to the strand, and we just were like, oh my God, these people are writing like they've been writing for most of their life, and we published those, uh, those two short stories. So if a person has a good idea, if a person has an original voice, uh, you know, we'd love to have them appear in the magazine because after all, I just, I never want to forget that, you know, that the magazine could have room for new voices. We just, we'd love our writers like Jeffrey Deaver who contributed to the magazine and uh, R.L. Stein, we love these people, but we also want to have the magazine be a force to bring out some of some people are just starting out. Yeah. 
Well, that's, I, I think that's a, that's a noble mission. It is. So <clears throat> you publish um, the, the stories and the, the interviews and the reviews uh, in the magazine, but I notice on your website you also have a blog, uh, which is an interesting concept for a magazine because, you know, on the one hand you've got uh, subscription-based content that you're asking people to pay for, and on the other hand you've got free content that presumably you're – kind of keeping the fire alive in between quarterly issues how do you how do you manage the balance between the two and how do you de- how do you determine which goes where well that's a good question i mean the the, the thing is it's just been uh, yeah i think probably the blog has contributed to some plateauing of my gray hair <laughs> because you know the magazine are fairly limited to about there are 90,000 words a year hmm. uh, in the magazine. And, and it's just so difficult to be able to cover everybody. And it really, really would bother me that writers would come up to me and they'd want help with something. They'd want one of their books publicized. And I would just have to tell them, look, you know, by the time all our stories are published, by the time all the reviewers have decided what they want to do, it's just very, very difficult to learn. Uh, it's very, very difficult to break out and, and author. So the blog has about 300 contributions a year, year from writers, and uh, and that made me very, very, very happy that we can have an outlet that can help break out new authors. Uh, a lot of times publishers will pitch me and I'll say, okay, this is a good idea for an article to write. Or I'll contact some authors who are just starting out. I'll say, hey, you know what? We have our blog. We get a lot of traffic, and we'd like to uh, we'd like to help bring you, uh, you know, bring your book uh, your book to a bigger audience. Hmm. Uh, it, it is interesting that when we started the design redesign of the website, uh, there was an internal debate about how are you going to separate the magazine from the blog. Uh, and just from a perspective of search engine optimization, from perspective of branding, we just decided the, the blog and the magazine will be under the same domain, but they'll be separate on the website so that people are not confused. So the website has a blog area, the website has the magazine area, and it's just it's easy to switch between the two, but we didn't want the blog just to fall under the umbrella of the magazine because it would just in a sense, diminish something that's updated almost every day. Sure. Well, that, that makes a great deal of sense, and uh, and clearly it's it's working. Also on the website, we notice that you've got a very healthy uh, shopping section. Uh, we've got all sorts of things uh, up for sale uh, for the um, uh, for the Sherlockian among us, as well as for the uh, just the more casual reader. Uh, what are some of the what are some of the favorite items right now in your Strand Magazine shop? Oh, so the, the, it's always fun for us to work on these products and design things that are exclusive. And that you know, when you have a magazine business, we have our, our a lot of customers who subscribe to our email. So it's just great to be able to offer them you know, gifts for Christmas and or you know all the major holidays and birthdays. And, and so, so we have uh, everything from lapel pins that are bestsellers. Our Sherlock Holmes calendar has orders from like from Taiwan to Iceland to hundreds of orders in the United States for the Sherlock Holmes calendars. Uh, we also have marble coasters, magnifiers. And, you know, we have uh, t-shirts. We have a quite a large line of Sherlock Holmes and mystery. Uh, and items for mystery fans. We even have a lot of uh, things like coffee mugs, beer glasses, uh, and a lot of them uh, harken back to the uh, old classic Strand magazine with a quote or artwork from Sidney Paget in the original Strand. So uh, you know, don't expect to have, have a mug saying there is no there is no place like Holmes. <laughs> it was Brad Mag shop. So that is giving me an idea. <laughs> well, and 
And obviously, uh, that's where you can pick up a subscription to the Strand Magazine as well. Um, how, how much is a subscription for a year? Uh, one year is twenty four ninety five. Two years is thirty nine ninety five, and three years is forty nine ninety five. All right. Huh. Yeah, bargain. So, so Andrew, let me ask you. Here you are, having found all this stuff, 20 years of publishing, talking to the writers, the blogs. Um, what's on your nightstand? What are you reading? Do you have any time to read anything recreationally, or are you just working all the time? That's a very, very good question. Sadly, this uh, weird inside-out thing has occurred, has occurred with me. So... There was the, uh, the, the the teenage version of myself was reading all these mysteries and Sherlock Holmes books, and now I find just for recreation, I'm reading books like American history books. So, and that was something I was completely uninterested in. Uh, you know, so one of the books that I read that was interesting was a book called uh, Berlin 1961 about the. Uh, uh, crisis between the United States and Russia. Uh, in terms of mysteries, I still uh, I still enjoy reading a lot of uh, some of the mysteries, and that's because you know part of it is because I'm enjoying some of these books, and another part of me is I need to I need to see what's going on with the business. I need to see who are the new and exciting writers. Uh, I did enjoy Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. I thought that was a great book. Uh, I'm a big fan of the works of Jeffrey Deaver, Joseph Bender. I think they're they're fantastic authors. Uh, in terms of espionage, I don't think I can find a better better espionage novel than uh, Legends by Robert Littell. Uh, I think that's a great book, and I do go back and read some of the the works that inspired me to do what I am doing and to be. To be completely frank, if I were to tell you the three three people that are the reason I am in this business, they would be Arthur Conan Doyle, who would be number one, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson would be number two, and Roald Dahl's Tales of the Unexpected are number three. Because if you look at these three authors and you see the level of creativity, the level of how versatile they were, to me, they are the primer for any beginning author. You've mastered these authors and all their, read all their works and just read them almost as somebody who's taking an anatomy lesson. Uh, and if a beginning author has done that with these three writers, I don't think they have much to worry about if they just com- combine their knowledge of those authors with some of their life experiences and their imagination. Well, that's a that what a great observation. Yeah. Do you um when you when when you read, let me ask you this, have you thought at all well, you must have thought of, thought about it. But if, do you do you have a Kindle? Do have you thought about uh, ebooks? Is that anywhere on your horizon as a consumer or a publisher? You know, I I have a Kindle, but I think I'm a little Victorian in that I know people who know how to how to mark pages in Kindles and when I read a Kindle I'm just like you know, scrolling page to page. And I just find that I'm not, I don't retain as much as I do with reading an e-book that I, that I will with a, with a something that I can, physical book that I can hold with my hand. I mean, I have two Kindles and one of them is, you know, I just look at it like a wonderful gadget where I can watch the Olympics, you know, or, or try to call you guys with Skype. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, so... I, I do enjoy the feel of physical books because I just, a Kindle has, you know, with a Kindle you just, you don't have that feel that you do where you could just like mark a page, go back to your favorite page so quickly, you know, just almost even run your hands past the page. And, you know, when, uh, you know, I know I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, go a little off topic, but when people have asked me about, how they should write, what should their writing style be, you know. One of my biggest, biggest tips is that, you know, when you look at a page, a page of a book should not only have great material, excitement, creativity, but 
if you open a page of a hardcover book, a hardcover book written by a good writer is going to have a balance to it. And I always say, when you open it up, it should be a couple of paragraphs, and there should be some dialogue, and there should be a short paragraph, and then a slightly longer paragraph. And it's almost like a work of art. And, you know, whenever I'll open up a book, and I'll, let's say I'm going to go into a bookstore, and if I see something all dialogue when I'm opening up a book, I'm going to know that the writer was, you know, trying to write almost a play and just package it as a novel, just where it's, you know, very little description. And then if I open up a book and I just see that there's just like five long paragraphs and three short paragraphs of dialogue, uh, you know, I'm going to know that this is going to be a cure for insomnia. And I already have... <laughs> You know, My Universities by Maxim Gorky, which can always, you know, effectively put me to sleep within two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of that is lost with an e-book, because when you look at an e-book, it just manages to compress a page into a very small image. So, you know, that's another one of my, uh, one of my issues with e book But I know they're fantastic. I know that they're great and that you know, people love instant gratification click and within two seconds you can buy 15 books I used to do it I was you know I used to you know, work and then you know have dinner and go to bed and then I'd find that I spent fifty dollars in the space of five minutes at 1 a.m <laughs> <laughs> let's go from written word to art the each cover of the strand magazine has some lovely artwork. Can you tell us at all about the inspiration there or the, the artists or what some of the views are? That's another thing that's like an unpublished, uh, the unpublished work that is getting a, become a scarce commodity in that I do a lot of research online. And, and if I find something that I really like, I'll contact the artist and I'll say, hey, can I, uh, can I use your cover and we'll, you know, of course, credit you. Uh, and the sad fact is, like, for every, you know, every, let's say, 10, uh, 10 pieces of art that look like they'll work in the magazine, only maybe three will end up working out. So I just hate to disappoint somebody by saying, this is looking really promising. And then, like, have you used my cover? And I'm like, I'm so sorry. If I, you know, if I could afford to, I would buy your artwork and hang them up, hang, hang, hang your work in my house. But... It's just a question of how the titles will look against the background right. and how it all fits in together. And it's just so, so, so sad that, you know, uh, a lot of these people would get very excited or, or a lot of times I'll get very excited. And then, I, and then once everything is put together, it just doesn't work out. Uh, I mean, I've had, we had one artist who, Michael Alford, he lives in England. And we chose about six of his covers uh, for the magazine. So he's uh, he's our most successful uh, artist. And then, of course, the first issue of the Strand magazine had who else but Atkinson Grimshaw. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and at, 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 at Atkinson Grimshaw's work has probably graced more covers of Sherlock Holmes books than any other artist. Yeah. In fact, that's one thing that I can declare. <laughs> Uh, well, it's a, it's a wonderful effect, you know, certainly a distinctive look. And, um, you know, the Strand Magazine uh, from 1891 to 1950 was, of course, famous for its uh, very consistent cover, the same uh, view down the Strand. Uh, that That's, you know, kind of what, uh, what was the hallmark of what uh, the Strand Magazine was in those times. So, you know, visually, I think you've built a very strong uh, property here as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just something that I, I believe in, because, but a lot of times you'll hear from advertisers and they just, you know, they can confuse the magazine for being either a literary magazine or for being a nostalgia magazine or a historical period piece magazine. And you just have to just explain that this is just our trademark. Our trademark is a dark street scene and that's just it. It just doesn't reflect what's in the magazine. Yeah. And, I could just not imagine, you know, having covers of people on the magazine because I think that, you know, you want to evoke a sense of time, a sense of place. 
And that's not just very effective by having a photo of a, you know, photo of a writer, you know, looks like a photo from a writer taken in a photography studio. I mean, I don't right. think, uh, to me and to, I think, a lot of our readers, it's not something that would compel them to pick up a magazine or read a magazine. Right. Right. Well, you're getting ready to go to press now with the latest uh, quarterly edition. Uh, what are some of the highlights in it? Well, we have a, a wonderful Sherlock Holmes piece by David Markham. Uh, and he, to me, has proven to become a real revelation. He's, you know, he is a fantastic author, and I just hope he ends up, uh, you know, ends up getting some uh, national prominence for his work. I mean, he's had a couple of uh, collections published by smaller presses, uh, but he is, I think, on his way. We have a short story by Jeffrey Deaver, Lincoln Rhyme Story. Uh, we have an interview with uh, Caleb Carr, the author of The Alienist, and that guy is really outspoken. <laughs> mm. uh, so that, that, was, that was quite refreshing. And then we have an essay by Lisa Gardner yeah, about tips for authors. And we have a bunch of book reviews and a few more short stories. And it, Oh, and, uh, and this is some news. We have a short story by William Trevor. Uh, that has that will be released in book form in June, but we have first serial rights uh, published this story. And I've always been a big fan of William Trevor, but he always had an exclusive uh, arrangement where he would give all his short stories to the New Yorker when he was uh, when he was alive. But sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago, and we heard that the new collection of his unpublished stories would be released this year. So I said to myself. Okay, it's on my bucket list. I need William Trevor. <laughs> well done. Well done. Well, Andrew Gooley, Managing Editor of The Strand Magazine. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, folks, again, if you want to check it out, go to strandmag.com. Uh, there you will find everything you possibly need to know about The Strand. There's so much content. Uh, I mean, we could have explored at least a dozen other avenues here with Andrew, uh, but there is so much to explore there. Get yourself a subscription if you're so inclined. Uh, shop around. Um, uh, hey, at least subscribe to the blog. There's there's that. Um, but, Andrew, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, share your story and your vision for the Strand Magazine with us and our listeners. Yeah. My pleasure. It was fun chatting with you guys, and I hope we can chat again one day because this yeah. was great. Good to talk to Sherlockians and, and wonderful ambassadors to the greatest fictional character of all time. <laughs> How about that? Well, you know, the fascinating thing about – there's so many fascinating things about this just in retrospect, thinking about back on the conversation. I had not – I'd lost track of the fact that the Strand Magazine had now been with us for 20 years. I mean that's certainly one thing. The second thing is how common this theme is. You know, I think we touched on that. The common the theme is the desire to publish and communicate. You know, it's sort of the other side of this literary interest. But but the most amazing thing about talking to Andrew is the things that he's, his enthusiasm have uncovered over the years. You know, an unpublished Raymond Chandler story, an unpublished H.G. Wells story, a Faulkner play – that nobody had heard of a Tennessee Williams horror story that hadn't been seen. Um, it's amazing how the dogged determination and the focus on research and the interest in these sorts of things leads to these kinds of discoveries. Well, and when you really step back and think about it, the original strand magazine was not solely a vehicle to introduce Sherlock Holmes to the public on a regular basis. But it was really a conglomeration. Uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, news items of the day, celebrity sightings. Uh, it was an opportunity to introduce the world to new authors. 
And the editors of The Strand certainly went out of their way to try and discover new authors and to uh, promote existing ones. And Andrew has really kind of stepped into that role in a uh, 21st century um, setting and and continues to hold up that original uh, intent of The Strand magazine, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. That's one thing we should have asked him is, uh, you know, what his thinking was about George, George Noons and the founding of the Strand. And did he really see himself following in those footsteps? Because you're right, he really is. Hmm. Yeah. Well, we have some other footsteps that you should follow in, namely our friends from the Baker Street Journal. The magic of the Baker Street Journal isn't that it's been published for 70 plus years. It isn't that it's entirely volunteer-driven, either. The magic of the Baker Street Journal is that it fills a need in the Sherlockian universe. Because we have an intellectual curiosity that leaves us wanting more after we close the pages of the canon. Because we must know more about Sherlock Holmes' childhood, or about train timetables in Victorian times, or the inspiration for the Diogenes Club, or the official location of 221B Baker Street. Yes, we are creatures of knowledge who seek more information about our pastime, and the BSJ provides it. But the real magic of the Baker Street Journal is that the articles and artwork that appear in it are entirely fan-created. The reason that the BSJ can continue to publish after seven decades is because of the passion creativity, and tireless efforts by devotees of Sherlock Holmes worldwide. And it doesn't show any signs of abating anytime soon. Now's the time to get on board or to renew your subscription. Visit BakerStreetJournal.com and be part of that magic today. Always good to hear about the Baker Street Journal, and all you have to do is look at the table of contents for the current issue, the winter 2017 issue, and get a sense of what still the amazing things that are still in there. A great essay by Les Klinger, a most desirable residence, Chris Redmond on the death of Baron Dowson. Who is that? You wonder. Um, Shoskam Old Place, illustrating the Gothic, Camp by Candace Lewis. Sherlockian Gothic in Conan Doyle's Last Bow. Um, Peter Calamai uh, has a paper in there about the Hound. And um, I don't know. It's always a real treat to find it in my mailbox. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I look forward to the obituaries uh, for the most part. <laughs> Catch up on no. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry to tell you that you were in there. Well, it's uh, yeah. I hope not. Uh, do like do like. Uh, was it Red Skelton? He said. He said every day I wake up and if I don't uh, see candles and smell flowers, I get up. Um, but um, you know the the, the terrace. Interestingly enough, uh, it is a little bit morbid, but it's part of our way of marking. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, obviously the passing of members, but of acknowledging their contribution to uh, the world in general, not just the Sherlockian world, but, you know, they're taking stock in their achievements overall as family people and as uh, business people and, and in their respective professions. And I know um, most recently, just uh, this past month, uh, we discovered that uh, Paul Herbert passed away. And uh, Paul was a longtime member of the Baker Street Irregulars, good friends with Ralph Hall, who always organizes the uh, the vendors' room at the BSI weekend. And uh, the two of them were inseparable. And uh, the state of Ohio uh, and its Sherlockian organizations owe a lot to Paul and his work. So uh, we remember Paul fondly, and we send out uh, the very best wishes to his widow, Barbara. Oh, that's very well said. Well, in lighter news, why don't we get over to canonical couplets? You recall that in the last episode, we placed this one in front of you. Of all the ills with which our race is cursed, a poker-bending doctor is the worst. The story that uh, that one is taken from, of course, is The Speckled Band, and none other than 
Andy Solberg, who was actually in the last episode, uh, was was the first to respond in that one. And before you say it, no, we did not record the quiz with Andy on the line, so he had to listen to it just like everyone else. <laughs> so we have a thank you gift heading out to Andy. And now, for the next version of Canonical Couplets, are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? Okay. Here it is. Identify the Sherlock Holmes story from which this couplet is taken, or, or to which this couplet refers. Here we go. When lovely woman to adventure stoops, she turns the wisest of us into dupes. If you think you know the answer, send us an email at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. Be the first to answer it correctly and be a patron or some somehow support us financially, either via Patreon or PayPal, and you will win the prize. Good luck. Well, I don't know what kind of luck we need for the next episode because we're running up on episode 140. <laughs> That's a canonical number, isn't it? 140, a canonical. Now, what is the canonical connection to 140? Well, of course, it's the number of variety of ashes of tobacco <laughs> that uh, Holmes w was able to identify in his monograph. Uh, that means that uh, our podcast must be smoking. Smoking! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must be smoking something, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well played, sir. Well played. Well, to see who we have on the program for next time, you'll just have to tune in. Until then, I am pleased to remain Scott Monty. Until then, I have my dottle, and I am Bert Wolder. Good plug. <laughs> <laughs> the, the game's afoot! You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs>